I genuinely thought I was going to be an elite athlete. When I was younger, that's what I thought I was going to be when I grew up. Um, life doesn't always work out like that, does it? But you give it a go. greatest achievements when I was a young athlete was probably winning back-to-back -back English schools titles and then representing my country, getting to travel around the world, going to training camps in South Africa, racing in India, racing in Europe. It all started at school sports day. I was due to run in the 200 meter event against my best friend Sophie who I thought was the fastest girl on the planet. You know when you have that in your head that someone is just amazing at something. So in my head I thought I was gonna come second that day and I didn't, I went on to win it. And I crossed the line and my dad, obviously my parents were there, and I said to my dad, I wanna be a runner, I'm gonna be a runner when I grow up. I couldn't go to the gym, I couldn't go to a dance class, I couldn't go to, um, to a, a group a group workout, but I could just literally step out the front door, run for 20 minutes, and then be back. So I grew up a one of four, and I'm an older sibling. And looking back now, I definitely think that has informed a lot of who I am, what I do, how I see the world, what I think is possible for myself. I guess my mum maybe just taught us that you had to just get involved and you know learn and do things for yourself and you know I learned independence at a very young age. Every team sport that I could do I did that and then also dance. I did dance lessons from the age of 12 and I'd say by the time I was 13 I was probably dancing every single night after school. I mean I worked in lots of different theatres but I guess the most memorable and, and was being in We Will Rock You, the musical, which is uh, the Tottenham Court Road Theatre. Felt a little bit surreal actually sometimes, being like, wow, this is actually my job to, to be here. It's something that, you know, training as a dancer and when you're young, you know, going to the West End and watching shows, you kind of feel like it's, um, yeah, it was a real aspiration. And then to actually be on stage every single night in front of 2,000 people, um, yeah, it was pretty mad actually. Two thousand and five, we'd just been on a family holiday to Mexico, and we came back, and my brother um, was suffering a few headaches and had a few problems, and he got diagnosed with a, a very rare brain tumor. He was twelve at the time; I would have been fifteen at the time. You know, super naive. No one knows what a brain tumor is. You just think it's got a little bit of a problem; it's going to be sorted out. And it became quickly apparent that. This was super aggressive and nothing stopped it growing. He continued fighting and trying to get better until um, December of that year, December 2006, the 12th of December, a month before his 14th birthday. Um, yeah, lost his battle to cancer at home with my mum, dad and sister and myself all around him, um, which, yeah, like, you don't prepare for that as a 16-year-old, and worsely, you don't prepare that for a 13-year-old. You know, him, no child should lose their life at 13. Like, it's terrible. From that, and I don't know uh, when I realised that, you know, you can have positive, I think you think that life's gonna stop and everyone's gonna look after you and take care of you and um, help you a bit. <laughs> it doesn't happen, you have to just kind of get on with it. Um, yeah, and I did and our family did, and they're amazing, and yeah, running was what kind of kept me going. So my life then, if I think back, you know, as I said, I was young, I was 21, 22, um, newly wed, you know, secretly newly pregnant and it was exciting I think I just felt like um, 
I was excited for whatever was gonna come. I knew that, you know, having a baby was gonna change my life. But I guess the year that followed, I definitely wasn't expecting at all. I don't think anyone can, you know, we can never predict what's around the corner. Um, and actually the year that followed, so six months after we got married, um, Rob actually became really, really unwell. Really suddenly, just one night, he actually had a brain hemorrhage and had a seizure. And I had never seen anyone have a seizure before in my life. So that in itself is probably a memory that I'll never forget the rest of my life. Um, and the fact that I was pregnant, I guess, yeah, I felt, you know, you feel vulnerable when you're pregnant anyway. But that definitely started a whole new chain of events, a whole new life, essentially, just from that one moment, from that one night. Because from there, he then went to uh, a neurology ward in a hospital. We arrived there in an ambulance. I was in my pyjamas. And actually, he was there for two weeks. So definitely a big change. And actually, that night when I left the theatre, and I was like, you know, see you tomorrow. And I never went back because the next day, I was in the hospital. And then two weeks later, when Rob got discharged and came home, I then couldn't leave him to go to the theatre because um, he was, have, you know, in case he had a seizure. There was a lot of conversation about whether I'd return to the show or not. But then as my bump was getting bigger and he wasn't able to work, so yeah, I never, never went back. In those weeks, I didn't even think about the theatre. I didn't even think about my job. I didn't even think about myself as a dancer. Or It just seemed so irrelevant, actually, and so unimportant. It really put things in perspective. In, that, in those moments, I was thinking about Rob's health, is he going to recover, how many weeks until this baby comes and actually what's our new life going to look like if he can't work, what's his life going to look like if he can't drive, what's my life going to look like if he can't drive and we have this baby. Yeah, I felt, definitely felt a lack of sense of control which I absolutely hated and that caused me to just feel really overwhelmed actually, so overwhelmed. I was just like, I didn't plan this, I didn't choose this, you know, he didn't choose this, he didn't do anything to cause this, this whole thing of like, why, why, why? I definitely felt like, yeah, my mindset at the time was just like, overwhelmed with trying to come up with answers to solve, like to stop anything bad happening again as well. In the beginning of 2007, um, I got a letter from Dane Kelly Holmes. And I, in my head, I was like, this is so cool. You know, I want to be an elite athlete gonna happen even more now you know Ke Kelly's in my camp quite literally she tried to absorb all the information that she gave me um, she got us into some cool races so some diamond league races for that experience at top top level athletics yeah amazing time to have an Olympic champion as, as a mentor it gave me a lot anyway yeah I remember going to India and I you want I got a teddy and I want some flowers and a medal and I that was after he'd passed away, that was in 2008, so two years after, I took them to the crematorium, and that's where they are. Like, they're, they're for him. So, um, yeah, that was always, like, a part of the journey. If I didn't have running, I don't know where I'd have been. I could have gone off a tangent and gone off the rails, but running kept me on, like, the right path for me at the time, and, um, yeah, it gave me a real big focus. It wasn't until I think I'd processed what had happened that I was then like, I need a bit of time off. Like, this is too much for me as an 18 year old, 19 year old to deal with. And um, I vividly remember a training session at Norwich. I think I'd gone home in like a, a break from university or something. And I was doing, I think it was 600 meter reps. And I was on like five, the 500 meter mark of the 600 meter rep. I just stopped, walked to the track, sat down next to the Seville Chase barrier and just my, my coach at the time came over and was like, what's the matter, why have you stopped? And I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, and called my mom and she came and picked me up and I was like, I'm, I'm quitting, like, I'm having a break. Like, I don't want and my coach was like, you're so good, you could achieve this and the other. I was like, yeah, but I'm, I need a time out. And went home and I cried a lot and I was like, we'll, we'll find something else. And we've, I'll find something that fulfills me like my running did and makes me as happy. And if I find that, I don't need to go back to running in the capacity that I was in at the time, pushing myself, my body, physically, mentally. Yeah, so 2017, got the opportunity to run the London Marathon, first marathon. And at the time, to be honest, I was exhausted. 
physically, mentally, emotionally. So what do you do? Say yes to running your first marathon. That's a great idea. But seriously, I was, you know, the year before, um, I, we, the year before I'd been trying to, to get pregnant, trying to have another baby, and that was my focus and that was my goal. And that was all I wanted was to have a sibling for Jude. So that was what I wanted. And when it finally did happen after a long time, uh, I had a miscarriage and I just felt like I was back to square one again. I'd spent this whole year really just, yeah, feeling fed up, frustrated. Another thing that was out of my control, another thing that I couldn't, um, there was nothing I could do about it. So when that opportunity came out of the blue, I was just like, yes, this is what I need. I need something to focus on, something that is, that I can control, I can put in the work, I can determine the outcome of this. Um, and I said yes, and then basically had 12 weeks to train for my first ever marathon. I knew I wasn't gonna stop. I knew I was gonna get to the finish line some, some way, somehow. I just, yeah, wish I'd known a bit more about actually training. <laughs> But I definitely walked, I definitely cried. And I think when I crossed the finish line, I was so relieved that it was over. Oh my gosh, that was the toughest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I've never felt such pain like that. But I finished, I don't know how, I don't know how I got to the end, but I finished. Thank you everybody that cheered and supported and oh my gosh, don't know how I got here. I also remember thinking, if you can do this now, if you can be physically, emotionally, mentally, have feel like you've got nothing left and then run a marathon, I was like, yeah, okay, if you can do that now, what's next? What, what else, you know, what else can you do? And so I started pursuing a career in the media and literally didn't run for... 18 months, gave up, was sedentary. Uh, I'm kind of someone that puts all the eggs into one basket. But I didn't know anyone when I was in London. What's the best way to make some friends? Ah, I used to have so many friends when I was running because everyone in my training group was so friendly and people in my training group became my best mates. So I thought, okay, let's go and uh, go to do some running clubs in London. So I signed up to the Sunday brunch club. Um, Signed up to London Brunch Club, Track Mafia, Run Dem Crew. I went to the Sweatshop Running Club. Yeah, I was desperate for some friends, clearly. Um, and running became fun again. Like I said, I hadn't done it probably for 18 months. And I just started going there and I started hanging out with some cool girls, some cool guys. And I found myself, I had a community again. At one point I thought nothing else will replace this for me. I remember just thinking that nothing else would replace it. And I couldn't actually see a life that was better or, or as fulfilling. And it's just so interesting to me now that you know I have a life that I truly love. I love my life. I love my friends, my work, my running. I, I love my life so much. And you know, you can't compare one or the other, you know, had I been able to have more children or, or not. But I certainly, I just believe you can either focus on, you know, you can focus on the, the circumstance, the, the perceived parameters, whatever you want to call it, or you can focus on the future. You can focus on making choices. You can focus on creating something better for the future, but you can't do both. You can't do both. You have to decide. So I choose the latter. I choose to see the good. I choose to focus on the things that I now get to do the the wonderful things in my life and it's not to say that it's replaced it but as i say you can't do both even though i am a yeah analytical thinker even though i'm a problem solver even though i'm you know the, the self-improver and i care to a degree about improving my running i think when it comes to running for me it's never you can't complete running you can't tick it off and say i've done it you know, I've, I have completed running. It's always, it's, it's, it's infinite. You know, you can always go faster. You can always go further. You can always run in a new place or a new. So I think because I know I can never complete it, I can never uh, conquer it. 
I, it takes the pressure off. It, you know, I remember my son saying to me actually when I was training for the Berlin Marathon, and that's when you know I was tracking more around how many runs per week and miles and times, and he said to me before the race, "Oh, mummy, are you going to win?" Which obviously is great, you know. But I was like, "No," and that that's the thing is I'm I'm not standing at the start line of a marathon and thinking I'm going to win. If I was an elite athlete and you're there performance, then of course. But for me, you know. You can never conquer it, you can never complete it, so you might as well enjoy it. It is very much something that I will always have in my life. Um, I'm always going to be Rachel who runs, and it's for enjoyment, you know, it's to make me the best person I can be now. As a person, not as a competitor. Um, times are irre irrelevant. It's how it makes me feel when I go out the front door and how it enhances my life for the better and the person I am. Anytime I'm doing something where I don't notice the passage of time, so when you do something and suddenly you realise it's been two hours or you realise that you missed lunch or you're so in the moment and what you're doing, that for me is flow state and that can be when I'm running, that could be when I'm writing, could be when I'm listening to something and I'm so into it that I just don't notice the time passing. And again, when I talk about that feeling, anything that feels like it energizes me, it makes me excited, it makes me enthusiastic, that is the flow state for me. That's how I try to describe that feeling to others. When you're running, it's all about you. You're not bothered about what's going on at home or what you've got to do tomorrow. It's about the here and now and that happens for me in the evening. When you've had a busy day at work, you can leave that all at home and you can just kind of go out the door and focus on what you want to do and you're not looking at the watch and checking the time and your pace. Um, it's that time when you feel like you could run forever. So now running has become a part of my entire life. It's become a part of my identity, who I am. I think running gives me so much that I can't imagine ever not running, I think hopefully I'll always be a runner for the rest of my life. You know it's cold in bed The world it feels so sad to me Stay Stay.